Dear listeners, we need your support to increase the reach of this video. Kindly put a comment in the comment section below. A small comment from you would be a big help for us. Janet is a really short statured woman. At barely five feet, she would be easily overlooked in a crowd if only she weren't so beautiful and perfectly shaped. Sometimes I call her my fairy pixie. She shines with energy and positive enthusiasm. Her face actually glows and her eyes sparkle with happiness. All our 22 years of married life have been filled with her sparkle and tireless work raising our two now young adult children. She can be witchy meaning she wants her way regardless, but we usually talk it through, and then she gets her way once I understand what it is all about. We have shared joys and sorrows together. Our lives are so intertwined that I can't even think of life without her. She tells me the same and I have always believed her until. Well that's all about this story. I find myself in Southwest England, helping a fellow general practitioner in his practice. I'll be here another 11 months until my one-year contract runs out. Through friends I found out that Great Britain was recruiting international physicians for its national health service. This opportunity provided me with the perfect retreat from reality and space for my cheating wife. At 44, same age as my wife, I still have lots of life ahead of me, life alone possibly. If not alone, then certainly life terribly disrupted by events that recently came to my attention. I had a small cottage. It was typical English countryside and only a quarter mile from the office I worked in. I could walk or bicycle to work. My salary was adequate and the working conditions perfect for me. I had plenty of English style social life which I rather enjoyed. When folks found that I was estranged and in a divorce proceeding, I was amazed at the number of truly cute and vivacious young women who were interested in my social well-being. As of right now, I limit my social life to group activities which included a few double dates and I haven't even kissed any lassie yet. I really didn't want to. I wanted my wife back, big time. My heart ached for the time before I became aware of her cheating. Words cannot express the emptiness of life within and around me without my Janet. That is, without my exclusive Janet. It was her revelation that she was sharing her body with her young lover that drove me away. It was her demand that I allow her to continue that I could not handle. Yes. She wanted to continue to be married to me. Nothing had changed in her behavior toward me. It was when I discovered her ongoing affair and the depth of its emotional nature that I left her and my marriage. Well before all this, I had given up my private practice because of the administrative problems caused by cheating HMOs and giant insurance companies, among other things. I had taken to being a locum tenens physician. This allowed me to frequently be at home during otherwise normal working hours. Sometimes I would work in an emergency room for a weekend, making enough for a week's income in two 12-hour shifts, all without any administrate junk except keeping up my license, CME, and malpractice insurance. When our second son left home for college, Janet wanted to go back to work. That was fine with me. She wanted to be useful and earn some income also. She said she wanted to find a challenge in life and work to make a success. For years, we had had separate bank accounts. That way, each of us could have our checkbooks whenever we wanted. We each had our own separate credit cards also. For the past three years since Janet had been working, she put her salary into her own checking account and paid her own credit card. For many years Janet had paid all our bills, whether mine or hers, they were always ours. That is until she got a job and separate credit card. Now we had my bills which were things like taxes, insurance, utility bills, home loan payments, food bills and gasoline. My income went exclusively into my account and her income into her account. Then there were her bills. These were for her cosmetics clothing, and her credit cards. I never bothered to look at her bank statements or credit cards. I trusted her, and she never asked me for money anymore. As a result of our both working, even with the kids' college expenses, we began to put more money away for retirement in our separate IRAs. Other than our separate income and expenses, we continued to share everything in common. Our sex life was vanilla and not frequent enough for me, but I had no real complaints. She was still energetic in bed, but we had decreased frequency to not even twice a week. Sometimes she wanted me to do things that I just couldn't do. She wanted me to play dom and sub with her. When she told me what it was, I just couldn't do it. I felt like I would be humiliating her. After a couple of times pillow talking about it, we just dropped the subject. It all sounded so kinky to me. Calling one master or slave just was degrading to me. I discounted this to just a normal fantasy stuff. Janet worked for a large group of physicians. This group was a major off-campus site for medical students and even residents to take preceptorships. As a result, medical trainees were frequently in the office attached to different doctors. My wife worked as a nurse for two of the family physicians in the group. She had frequent contact with medical students and residents in training. 
I got home early from work one afternoon while Janet was still at work. As I drove in, I got the mail from the mailbox along with the daily paper. Usually Janet does this. That was the mail and paper are sorted out and ready for me to read when I get home. After getting a Diet Coke and a handful of animal crackers, I settled in on my lounge boy chair to read the mail. In the mail was her statement from her private credit card bank. For no particular reason, I opened it. Perhaps I was looking for one of the numerous, sometimes interesting commercial offers for unneeded trinkets that accompanying the payment due statement. I perused her short list of bills. One caught my eye. It was a bill from a local third-rank motel for one-day charge. I looked again and saw a series of dates and charges for the same motel. I had no idea what this was all about. I got up to go to my den to check my work calendar. The charges were all on Wednesdays of last month. I gasped as I then checked my day planner. I had been in town every one of those days, working in an emergency room on a noon to midnight second coverage shift. Janet had also not left town. She had been home when I arrived shortly after midnight every early Thursday morning. Something in my gut squeezed down on me. I could not think of a reason for these bills other than sinister infidelity happenings. Never in my worst nightmares could this scenario occur, yet here it was staring me in the face. The statement mocked me as if laughing at my trust in my wife. My first reaction was to look to see if this was only last month. I knew where she kept her statements in a desk drawer in the master bedroom. She made no special effort to hide these. I guess that helped my trusting her. I had no reason to look at them and therefore had not done so before. Her drawer where she kept the past statements was my next stop. She obviously trusted me not to look at her statements as they were neatly filed and easily accessible in the second left drawer. I got out the previous month's statement. Yeppers. Every week there was a bill from the motel. Usually it was a Wednesday, but not always. I compared the dates with my work calendar, and each was when I was either out of town overnight or working to midnight. Finding the months previous, I verified that there were another four weekly bills from the same motel. I went back to the January statement, some eight months ago. There to my dismay and horror were three weekly bills from the very same motel. Also there was a bill from a four-star restaurant for over $100. Meals and alcoholic beverages itemized. I was sure that I had not eaten there with her. The bill was too large for just one person, so she had paid for at least two people's dinner. I had a pattern of bills at a motel. Janet had not told me anything about these. I had no reason to question her, until now, as I knew nothing about them. Tonight I was going to confront her, and get an explanation. I put everything back in place and went to my den and computer to try to make sense of all this. Already I knew the answer, but had to get her to verify it. I had to make plans immediately and set about doing the needed. I got my suitcases from the attic along with two closed bags. I put these in my bedroom closet as I figured last night was my last night in this house with her. I ordered pizza and salad to be delivered. The table was set with our good china and real silverware along with candles and wine glasses. I straightened up the great room and cleaned the kitchen. My nervous actions allowed me to do something with my hands while my heart and mind raced in a thousand directions. My perfect life had come to a crushing end. My trust had been misplaced. I wondered for how long this had been going on. The whys and whos and whens overwhelmed my mind into a numbed sense of nothingness. Obviously, our lives had become untwined and now I was floating around in life without my mooring. After all, she was home and life to me. I heard a car come up the driveway. The doorbell rang so I knew it was pizza delivery. He left leaving me with a hot pizza, cold salad, and a bottle of chilled Chardonnay. The wine went into the cleaned refrigerator, the pizza into the warming oven, and the salads into two dishes in the refrigerator ready for serving. I heard my wife's car arrive as the garage doors opened then shut. She was in the house as I welcomed her with a warm hug and kiss. For a moment, I forgot anything could be bad between us. Having her in my arms was my life and my home. The dark thoughts crashed back in and I disentangled from her arms, pushing her away gently but definitely. Janet, I tried not to let my voice waver. I have a pizza dinner for us tonight. Go wash up as I serve it all up. What's the special event, John? She inquired with a twinkle in her eye. Just go wash up, Janet. I urged her as I turned toward the kitchen. I checked for her latest credit card statement still in my trousers pocket to be sure I had it. We sat and enjoyed the pizza, salad and wine. I poured a second glass for myself and offered her a fill-up which she took. I rarely had a second glass but tonight I felt the need. You are outdoing yourself, John, she giggled. You never have a second glass and here you are turning out to be a real alcoholic. She giggled and lightly kicked me under the table. We bantered lightly as we finished the meal. Let's clean up and have a coffee, Janet. I have a little light desert and a subject for conversation. We cleaned the table. 
We put the excess pizza into the oven and corked the wine for the refrigerator. The coffee had brewed and I produced some light, little dolly cake squares. I knew these were her favorite desert. I didn't particularly like them. They tasted too artificial for me but were perfect for tonight. I thought, sweet on the outside. She liked them but I was revolted by the inside taste. It reminded me of what might be coming in a moment or two. Usually when we have a subject to discuss, we sit next to each other on the couch. This time, knowing it was going to be a confrontation, not a problem-solving discussion, I suggested we sit at the table again, facing each other. We sipped coffee as she dug into her tiny piece of sugar-coated cake. I had no taste for these and didn't even break one open with my fork. I just diddled with it, feeling increasingly nervous. Reaching into my pocket, I produced the envelope from her credit card bank. I took out the statement, unfolded it and said, this came today. I opened it. I have never done this before, but I guess a little voice was telling me to take a look at it. Janet, you have way overdrawn your account. I had an awful feeling as I flattened the statement out facing her and pointed to the weekly motel bills. I fear you have not overdrawn your credit card. It is our trust and marriage account that has been overdrawn. I looked at her intently. She looked at the statement. I had caught her red-handed. She is quick-witted, but didn't have an immediate explanation. I continued, Janet, I checked your other monthly statements going back to January of this year. I can clearly see charges from this same motel almost weekly over the entire year. There are other very suspicious charges also. I took a long breath and sat back in my chair looking her straight eye the eyes. I just want you to be honest with me about these. I have a right and need to know the truth. She took a long slow breath and began. John, I want you to know that I love you very much. I also want to stay married to you. Yes, I have a lover. He is now a first year resident at the university. We have fallen in love. She began to cry. At first we just talked. He was a student on a junior preceptorship with the group where I work. At first, he reminded me physically so much of you 20 years ago when we first met. He made me feel young again. Things progressed. How much do you want to know tonight, John? Lots more. I spoke firmly. He comes from a broken family and never really had a mother after his grade school years. I guess I became his surrogate mother for a while. Then we became like friends then the intimacies began. For the year we have been frequent sexual partners. I taught him almost everything about sex. I brought experience and he brought youth, vigor, and an aggressive style to our sex lives. Oh John, I'm not sorry at all for what I'm doing. I just hope that you will be understanding. I need the both of you in my life. I know how awful this sounds but it is so awesome to me. My sex life has been so wonderful with him. He is an alpha male. He is a true dominant and I have truly loved being his sub. You know that I like to be the aggressive one in the sex life you and I share. You never dominated me. You never hurt me or struck me or did anything even close to that. You never used nasty language when we make love. He calls me his witch and 304. When I am with him sexually, he owns my body and my heart also. All these are an aphrodisiac to me now. I expect you can't understand that but it's true. When he and I became lovers, he immediately became the dominant and I had to submit. I was afraid at first but then I learned to love being his truly submissive sub. The only thing I have refused him is to refuse sex to you. He demanded this but I stood firm on that point. The only bad thing has been the cover up on you. I never lied to you but I never told you either. I have not left you for him so I haven't broken our promises we made when we got married. I have been here for you for 20 years. She wasn't crying any longer. She was just explaining something to me as if she had found a new dress that she loved and hadn't told me about. I had not expected her to just come forward and answer the question before I asked them. She was being upfront with me. Janet, has he been in our house? Have you had sex with him here in my sanctuary? Yes, John. I didn't invite him. He demanded to come here and take me. He said this house is now his and I belong to him. Of course, I don't actually belong to him all the time. It's only when we are together. I was seething mad. She had made me into a chicken and cuck. I was heartbroken but had not given in. Not by a long shot. No damn arrogant surgeon was going to do that. The may denigrate us ER docs, but I won't let him humiliate me with my family. No way was that going to happen. I almost spit these at her. My body tightened and I glared in hatred at her for the first time in my life. Janet, I looked at her and reached out to take her hand across the table. If you break this off immediately, I will try my very best to keep our marriage intact. Will you do that? You must be forceful and truthful to him about never seeing him again alone for any reason. Will you call him right now while I am on the phone with you and tell him it is all over between you? Oh John, please don't say that. 
You don't know how much I love him and how much he loves me. I love you too. I need both of you. Janet, my voice took on a more threatening and angry tone. There is no option as far as I see it. You will do this or our marriage is over as of tonight. I will not continue to share you sexually with anyone, male or female. You know how I have always felt about this. We have 20 plus years and two children together. Are you going to throw these away? My life will be destroyed. I will be adrift in life without the only woman I have ever loved and trusted. Please tell me and show me that I am your real man. I waited but she just shook her head sadly, looking down at the table. I got up from the table. I put my hands under the table and lifted it up, turning it on top of her. She fell backward with the table top on top of her. She screamed in fright. I stomped off to the bedroom and finished packing in silence. I heard her pushing the table off her body. I went to the bedroom door and locked it. I didn't want to talk to her anymore. It took me only a few minutes to complete what I needed from the bedroom. I was seething in rage. Unlocking the door, I found her sitting on the floor across from the bedroom door waiting for me. She had been crying but had quit. I didn't offer to help her up. Walking past her I told her I would be back in a few minutes to get a few things more from my den. The two suitcases, the hanging bag and I made it to the garage and into my car. Returning to my den, I put my laptop into its carrying case along with several external memory chips and a stack of CDs. Next came all my financial files which I put into a cardboard box. I included files on the house and my car. I removed the side from my tower computer and removed the hard drive. Next came some of my more needed medical books. These went into the trunk. As I came back, Janet was still sitting on the floor in the hall where she had been sitting, as if in a trance. She had pushed the table off her. I grabbed her and dragged her to the bedroom which was a mess by now. I was not careful to pick up after myself as I usually did. I pushed her onto the bed then pulled her up to a sitting position. I stood in front of her. I intended to dominate her physically and emotionally if at all possible. Janet, I am out of your life as of right now. You can have all you want of your new Dr. Lover boy. I hope he will take care of you as well as I have. I hope you don't do to him what you have done to me. I will find somewhere else to live. You will hear from my yet-to-be-found divorce lawyer in a few days. I have my cell phone and will listen to any messages you have for me. I won't promise to return your calls and I don't plan to let you know where I am staying for the time being. Oh yeah, you can have the rest of the pizza and wine. My life is going to be filled with new wine. I will not tell you goodbye or goodnight for good is not in my vocabulary when I think of you anymore. I turned and left her and my 20-some years of shared life and family. I found a motel for the night then moved into a furnished mobile home. I did all the things that every recovering male does. The credit cards were cancelled and reissued. I took her off my bank account. I took care of all the other financial things including my will, an IRA, and 501 c With heaviness of heart, yet with my anger not yet fully controlled I met with a divorce lawyer. He did nothing to encourage me. I had no proof so I was going to lose big time. I told him I didn't care. Give her half of everything and all the equity in the house with the stipulation that her lover would never be able to enjoy the house ownership. I would not pay alimony. That part was non-negotiable. Never more would I support her. She had her own business and her lover was a doctor. He understood and started the papers. I asked him to give me the completed papers to serve on her when he had filed them. Janet and I were recognized as legally separated upon the filing the divorce papers. I continued to work and putting my income into a third secret bank account. This made no sense really as it could be discovered easily, but it made me feel better. She would have to look for it. I was not going to cooperate at any level on anything regarding her. I called the kids and told them what had happened. I minced not words, giving them enough details to convince them I was right and she was totally wrong. They called her and told her they were divorcing her. She would not be their mother anymore. I didn't care if she was hurt. I called her parents and mine and told them the same true story in as much detail as they wanted. A week later, the divorce papers were filed and I had my copy to take to her. My lawyer said he would formally serve her that evening at 8 p.m. I called Janet from my mobile home. She answered right off. Janet, I am coming over tonight at 7.30 to talk. If you want to talk, this is going to be your opportunity. If you don't want to talk then I'm coming over to talk to you anyway. John, you are welcome. This is your home and you belong here. Can I fix dinner for you? No, Janet. If we have coffee and some fruit that will be enough. I hung up before she could say anything else. She was trying to say something, but I had no need to listen to her. I grabbed a 6-inch Subway and diet drink on the way that evening. I had the papers in my pocket as I rang the doorbell. Janet opened the door and I walked in. 
She did not try to hug or kiss me which I thought was very unlike her, but we were separated, so maybe she was really done with me. I hurt but quickly recovered. John, I have someone here who wants to meet you. I looked at a young man with scraggly goatee and a sneering grin. He was easily 6 foot 4 inches and 230 pounds. Next to my dainty 5 foot 2 wife, he toured over her and me too. I was only 5 foot 7 and a meager 145 pounds. I glared at him for I knew who he was automatically. Janet had not said she wanted me to meet him, only that he wanted to meet me. I was physically afraid of him. Quickly my mind turned to means of self-defense if needed. I had never boxed and knew nothing of the martial arts. I was a doctor, pure and simple. I helped people, not fought with them. I remembered the snub nose 38 caliber I kept under my old underwear in my bedroom. It should still be there. He approached me menacingly. Who are you, and what are you doing in my house with my wife here tonight? Janet and I need to be alone to talk of difficult matters, so I'm asking you to leave quietly and peacefully now. John, this is Dr. Sparks. He demanded to be here tonight. I had no choice but to allow him to stay. You know of our relationship? Janet replied assertively. He kept walking toward me. He had not extended a hand, nor did I. We glared at each other. I backed to the wall as he advanced. My heart was pounding in fear. You both must excuse me for a moment. I need to pee. I scurried down the hall to my bedroom. It had been recently used. There were ropes attached to the four corners of the bed. The sheets were messed. There was the smell of sex in the room. Janet had been having sex just before I arrived and a hole wasn't about to leave without humiliating me. I vowed to myself that I would die or spend my life in prison before that would happen today. Quickly, I found my snub nose 38 and checked it. It had six rounds. I moved the safety to off and slid it in my right pocket. I returned to the front room. The both of them were seated on my couch. I looked at my watch and it was five minutes to eight. Five more minutes until the deputy would arrive to serve the divorce papers. I wanted my timing to be perfect and was hoping the deputies would be also. Okay, Janet. You wanted your lover here so here we go. I walked to the couch. He started to get up, but I shoved him back onto the couch. You had your invitation to leave, a-hole. Now get this right. You don't own me. You are not welcome here in my house. You do what I say. If you are ready to leave peacefully then you have your last chance. I suggest you take it. He jumped up as I moved back rapidly to avoid him. So you are the little weak chicken who thinks he owns this beautiful piece of female, huh? She has had a real man screw her. That's me, and she wants me. Look at me woman, and tell me you want me. He glared at me then looked at Janet. She sat there, her hands twitching as her husband and lover glared at each other. Yes, I want you, Dr. Sparks and I want John too. Don't call me Dr. Sparks, which? My name is Master to you. Now tell me you want me as your real man. I know Chicken here has smelled what used to be his bedroom. Tell me, which? Yes, Master, she faltered as she looked at me. A-hole. The exit door is to your right. Take it and live. You may not walk out of here alive otherwise. That is not a threat. It is a solemn promise. I glared at the hunk standing some six feet from me. I threw the divorce papers at Janet. You adulteress, you are served. These are divorce papers. You will soon be free of me. I looked at a hole. That's what you wanted, isn't it? Looking back at Janet, I gritted my teeth and said, You threw me away. You humiliated me. You lost your children. Your parents have disowned you, and all for a hunk of worthless shit standing over here. I nodded toward a-hole. You wanted and loved being dominated. You wanted to be made into a 304. He will turn you into a common witch. I know his kind. They are arrogant. They think the world revolves around them. He will screw you silly and then throw you away. Then what will you have? I could see the burning anger in his eyes. Get out of my house. I yelled at him as he advanced on me. I backed up to the wall. I had nowhere else to go. I slipped my hands into my pants and fingered the gun. I would not fight him on his terms. My hands were useless and the source of my income. He was too arrogant to give any thought that his hands might be injured. My right index finger slid around the trigger but I didn't pull it or point it at him. I did not want him to know that I had protection. You slime ball of a chicken. He growled at me. You are mince meat. This is my house and my woman. Now you are going to be my man. He smiled a snarl and took another step closer to me. My heart was racing. I wanted him to touch me first. I sneaked a look at Janet, but she did not come to my defense. She sat rigid as in a trance. Janet, I stared over at her for a moment. Call 911 right now and ask for an ambulance and the police on a stat basis. Slimeball here is going to the hospital or the morgue. I looked back at him. I sneered at him. 
Okay, elephant balls, better leave now. This is the third and final warning. You are trespassing. If you touch me, you commit assault. And if you hurt me, you commit battery. That means jail time. So what will it be? I am no in charge here. Get out or get hurt badly. Then I whispered to him, you are all bluster. When a real man like me stands up to a slime ball like you, you just melt like a snowball in July. You are pathetic. You, chicken. I was going to tie you up like my witch loves then. Screw you, but now I've decided to beat your button balls. If you have any, then screw what is left, providing there anything left to screw. I'm going to have your balls for dinner. He balled up his fists and jabbed a right at me. I jerked my head to the left, but he caught me with a glancing blow to my left eye. His fist hit the wall and broke a hole in it. I felt the sting, but he missed mostly. From there on, things were a blur. I pointed the gun up from within my pocket and pulled off a single round. The blast deafened me, or was it his left fist hitting me square on the nose as I pulled the trigger again? I had kept both hands in my pockets. I dropped to the floor mostly unconscious. I heard the door break open as a brown-clad officer entered with Janet's formal divorce papers falling to the floor as he pulled his service revolver. Young Dr. Sparks lay partly on my rug, but spread mostly across the table that was last used by me to throw over Janet. He was screaming obscenities and holding his crotch. I heard sirens approaching as I laid on the floor wandering in and out of consciousness. I woke up in the emergency room I frequently staffed. I was receiving VIP treatment. A hole was in surgery. I was admitted to the hospital for observation. Apparently, as I fell, I had also hit my head and suffered a concussion. The hospital didn't want to lose one of their ER docs. I was out of the hospital in 24 hours feeling well except for sore muscles and a badly bruised and broken nose that had been straightened and bandaged. Mouth breathing is a bugger, but I would be free of the nostril stuffing in another few days when the swelling began to go down. All in all, I fared pretty well. My ego was intact. I thought, not a bad day for a chicken, cuck. I grinned as I left in a taxi for my mobile home. Janet was served. Young Dr. Sparks lost most his penis. Seems a 38 slug at close range hitting him dead on and just below the pelvic bone had destroyed his future abilities for erections and children he had had to have a diversionary colostomy and extensive rectal, pelvic, and bladder surgery. I smiled as I heard of his injuries. He lost a testicle too. He may never urinate from his penis again and most likely will never defecate from his rectum. Erections for him were a part of his past. I was satisfied. I thought again, Yes, not a bad day's work for a cuck chicken. I had to appear before the grand jury, but was not indicted. Janet and the deputy testified for me. I set up a confrontation with Janet, but she upped the ante. I tried to avoid the ensuing conflict with her lover, but could not. A man is allowed to defend himself from serious bodily harm in his own house in our state. The divorce went on as anticipated. I gave the house to Janet with the stipulation that young a-hole, Dr. Sparks could never set foot in it again and would never inherit it or have any financial interest in it. Ultimately, he lost his medical license also. Jane's demons set her free of me and her family. I pay no alimony. To her credit, Janet would not allow her lawyer to ask for alimony. She was still a cocky lady. I could not stand to stay in the same community as her. I would see her and it would light up old feeling of anger, disgust, loneliness and, yes, happy memories. So here I am in beautiful semi-rural southwest England, alone with my hurts and memories. The phone rang. It was my son's weekly call. It was good to hear their voices and appreciate the Southern American drawl. I had been here only a short while and I was already homesick. Then, I remembered. I have no home. I divorced her. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It was a fine July morning when I skipped down the steps into the quad. The manicured grass stood out green against the stone buildings and surrounding gravel paths. As a member of the staff, I was privileged to walk upon that hallowed turf. The sun was already warm and a blackbird sang his heart out as I breathed in the fresh morning air. Most of the pupils had gone home for the summer and I had just locked up my lab. I had eight weeks to spend in this idyllic part of rural England. Still, it felt to me as if I had simply exchanged one prison for another. True, I could come and go as I pleased. People, especially the parents, treated me with respect and I could even carry on an affair with Wendy, the school matron. However, I'd never be able to go back to my hometown and I couldn't marry Wendy. I was going to grow into a lonely old man with no more to look forward to than that blackbird. Strange, it didn't seem to bother him the way it bothered me. I was still feeling sorry for myself when a voice came from behind me. 
Well, if you've got to hide, I can think of worse places to do it. I turned to see a young man leaning against the wall beside the arch I had just walked under. He smiled as he spoke. He looked quite pleased with himself. I'd soon put a stop to that. Are you talking to me? I'm not hiding from anyone. Come off it, Dad. To just disappear as effectively as you did. And for it to take more than two years to find you, you had to be hiding. I haven't a clue what you were talking about. Now unless you are a parent or an employee here, you are trespassing. I suggest you leave and don't come back. I took up my privilege to walk across the grass and made for the arch in the opposite wall. As I walked away, I heard him calling after me. I'm not going until you talk to me, Dad. We have things to discuss. Leave me alone. I have no children. Just go away. I strode quickly through the cloisters towards my flat. I could hear him behind me, his footsteps ringing out on the flagstones. I pulled out my key and let myself in closing the door behind me. He hammered on the door several times before shouting through the letterbox. You'll have to come out sometime. I'm not going anywhere. I just want to talk to you. I was trembling as I started to make myself some coffee. It had been five years or more since I'd felt this way. I sat down at my kitchen table and tried to regain my self-control. I heard voices outside and then a key in the door. I turned and was relieved to see Wendy Turnbull come in closing the door behind her. I breathed a sigh of relief. She had a puzzled look on her face as she spoke. Derek, there is a young man sitting outside your door. He claims to be your son. Is there something you haven't told me? He's not my son. He is mistaken. I have no children. I told you that. Yes, Derek. I know you did and I believe you. But why does that young man believe he is your son? Why are you so shaken by his presence? I looked into Wendy's beautiful blue eyes. She was the one ray of light in a dark five years. She was the matron at Clifton Manor College and looked after the physical and emotional well-being of the boys. Many is the homesick 11-year-old who has found himself sobbing into her as he cried for his mummy. The older boys would give their right arms for a similar cuddle. Even in her nurse's uniform, she looked lovely to me. Over the last two years, we had struck up a relationship and had got to the stage where we each had a key for the other's flat. In fact, the only thing stopping us from sharing a flat was the talk amongst the boys and the effect it might have on the school if the parents found out. I sat down with my head in my hands. I'm sorry, Wendy. There are things about me you don't know, and that young man is a reminder of a time I'd rather forget. Nevertheless, he is not my son. He may think he is, but he is wrong. So tell me, Derek, why would he think he is your son? Because I'm married to his mother. Wendy sat down, a shocked look on her face. Well, that certainly explains a few things. You mean like why I haven't asked you to marry me? Yes, that's the reason I can't marry you or anyone else because I'm still married to her. So divorce her. I can wait. I can't divorce her without revealing my whereabouts, though that might be academic now. Now I'm really worried, Derek. Have you done something bad? Is that why you don't want to be found? I've done nothing that I haven't paid for, but if they find me now, they will put me back in prison. Wendy reached out and took my hands down from my face, holding them in her hands. Okay, Derek Callahan, first you're going to tell me the whole story. Then we are going to get that young man in here and find out what he wants. It all started a little over five years ago. Or at least that's when I realized what was happening. Dirty Harry, they used to call me. I thought it was just because I shared a surname with the lead character in the movie. I soon found out there was another reason. Just like Harry, I always seemed to get all the shit jobs. It wasn't always so. I had worked at Bronceston College for 10 years and always did my fair share of evening and weekend classes, but no more than anyone else. However, shortly after John Preston was appointed vice principal, things began to change. At first, I thought my job was under threat because I went from always exceeding my teaching hours to having to offer myself to other departments just to get close to my minimum. The thing about being below minimum hours was you couldn't refuse any course you were offered. I soon found myself working to 9 p.m. four nights a week, not to mention the weekend courses I had to do. My wife, Jessica, was faculty secretary and when John Preston was promoted, he took her with him so she worked normal office hours. We were becoming like ships that pass in the night. My sex life was in the toilet. I got home at 9.30 p.m. and needed at least an hour to wind down before going to bed. Jessica turned in at 10 and would almost always be asleep when I went to bed. I told Jess I would quit the college rather than continue to destroy our marriage, but she urged me to be patient and things would work out. Halfway through my second year of such treatment, I finally reached the end of my tether. My subject area was electronics, but I had to deliver mathematics and physics because, I was told, no demand existed for electronics. I was somewhat surprised when a colleague who ran the general engineering course approached me. Derek, 
I've got a little problem. I've got to deliver an electronics unit, and I haven't got a clue about the subject. I'm a mechanical man. Give me friction, drag factors, and equilibrium, and I'm the man but this stuff. You can't see it and can't feel it. How do I teach that? I've got a few books on the subject, but I need some advice on how to deliver it and what practical work to give them. Hang on, John. Are you under hours or something? Good God, no. I'm into overtime for this. That doesn't make sense. I'm under hours and I'm available. I'll do it for you. George Johnson, my head of department, looked up with a surprised look on his face as I strode into his office. Good morning, George. I've come to save you some money. I'm always up for that, Derek. What do we have to do? John wants someone to deliver the electronics unit in his course. He is over hours. You'll have to pay him overtime. If I do it, you don't have to pay overtime and I'll be up to minimum hours and won't have to keep accepting weekend work. Sorry, Harry. Oops, Derek. No can do. But why not? It doesn't make sense and the students will do better if I teach them. John admits he doesn't have a clue. I'm sorry, Derek, but just like you I have to do as I'm told. You mean that somebody has instructed you to keep me under hours? I can't say any more, Derek. Full of anger, I stormed into the head of faculty's office. I put the same deal to him and got the same sort of response. It seemed I had enemies in high places. I moved up the chain of command. Sooner or later, I must get to someone who couldn't pass the buck upwards. Jessica was somewhat surprised when I strode through the office and arrived at her boss door. You can't just go in, Derek. You have no appointment. He's busy. I walked in and found John Preston, our vice principal, sat at his desk talking into the telephone. He motioned me to sit down. I sat fuming while he finished his call. Eventually he put down the phone, shuffled a few papers, then turned to me and smiled. Now, Derek, what's got you? So hot under the collar that you burst in here interrupting my phone call? I'm trying to find out who is deliberately keeping me below minimum hours even when it costs the college money to do so. So far everything points to you, unless you are going to tell me that you are only following orders so that I have to go and talk to the principal. I've no idea what you are talking about, Derek. Why don't you explain it to me? John Preston was a tall, slim man with gray hair and piercing blue eyes. I looked into those eyes as I told him the story hoping something would tell me that I'd got the right man. Not a flicker showed as he told me he was most concerned that the college was spending money it didn't have. When I'd finished, he got up walked around and opened the door. He looked straight at me. Well, Derek, thank you for bringing this to my attention. You can rest assured that I will get to the bottom of it as soon as I get back from the Association of Colleges Conference. When will that be then, John? Well, I leave tomorrow and I will be in Brighton for the next three days. So, it will be Monday. So, you'll be down in Brighton for three days. That's near Ditchling, isn't it? Well, I would say that Ditchling was near Brighton, but yes, it is nearby. Why do you ask? Oh, nothing really. It's just that my son lives in Ditchling. Suddenly, everything became clear. Jessica was taking the time off to visit our son in Ditchling, just a short car ride from the place her boss was staying for the next three days. It seemed absurd, but it was certainly an explanation. He made sure I had to work on social hours so I wouldn't be home to question where my wife was. Are you alright, Derek? Jessica asked as I walked out the office. I obviously looked as stunned as I felt. I tried to pull myself together. What? Oh yeah. I'm fine, just got something on my mind. Is it something I can help with? No. It's work-related. Nothing for you to worry about. That night I got home to find Jessica packing for her few days away. When I walked into the bedroom, she quickly closed her suitcase. Any other day, I wouldn't have thought much of it but today, it had a new significance. It did puzzle me why she needed to take so many clothes for three days with our son and his wife. I did make a comment about the weight of the case as I lifted it off the bed. Next morning I offered to drive Jessica to the station. Oh, there's no need for that, Derek. I can get a cab. Oh, I insist. Why pay for a taxi when I have the time and a car to drive you? What sort of husband would I be if I didn't make the most of every minute I can spend with my wife? Well, okay then, but you won't be able to go onto the platform. She walked into the other room taking her phone with her. We shared an uneventful trip to the station. Jessica told me how excited she was about visiting James and Emma. It's a great shame you couldn't get time off and come with me, Derek. There was hardly a tremor in her voice. I had to admit she was good. These last two years we never seemed to get time off together. Still all that will change soon. What makes you say that? What have you done? I thought I detected real anxiety. Oh, nothing but John's promise to look into it when he gets back from Brighton. Hey, it's just occurred to me. You'll probably be traveling on the same train. I don't think so, Derek. Anyway, he'll probably be in first class. 
she started to sound nervous. At the station I carried her case to the barrier. I'll call you when I get home from work at night. No, don't, Derek. We may go out in the evening. I'll call you. She kissed me goodbye and told me she loved me. I left to go to work. It was going to be a busy few days. I had no problem wiring the bedroom. Just a single webcam was all I needed. Drilling the small hole through to the spare room to accommodate the cable was the biggest part of the job. I used that room as my study so it was a piece of cake to connect the camera to my Linux box and schedule it to record every evening's activity. John Preston's office was a different matter. For a start I had to gain access and I didn't have a key. As in most colleges, the cleaners come in early in the morning. So 6.30 a.m. saw me arriving for work. I made my way to the management offices as the cleaner finished work. She was about to lock the door as I called out to her. Don't bother to lock the door. I'm here now. Oh, are you Mr. Preston? I'm pleased to meet you. It really was that easy. In order to automatically install updates, it was college policy to leave computers running all night. That meant I didn't even have to find a host for the camera. I used a wireless unit and his own desktop to host it. Using a spare account from a student who had recently left, I hacked into the college servers. Soon I had a direct stream to my desktop, which I could activate remotely. From then on, it was simply a matter of waiting for their return. On Friday morning, I rang my son at home. There was no answer. I called his work number. Hello, James Callahan. Hello, James. How are you? Oh, hello, Dad. I'm fine. How about you? I'm grand as usual, missing your mother, of course. I expected her to answer when I called the house. Come to think of it, why aren't you there? Surely you could get a few days off for your mother's visit. He sounded embarrassed and didn't really want to talk to me. Oh, I did take Wednesday and Thursday off, but I had to come in this morning. My boss is delivering a sales pitch on Monday, and I've got to make sure he has everything at his fingertips. Yes, I suppose you do. So where's Emma? Did she have to work as well? Air? No. She's probably gone shopping in Brighton with mom. Ah uh, yes, Brighton. I might have known she'd end up there. Look dad, I've really got to get this work done. Why don't you call mom on her mobile? Yeah, maybe I will. Well, I'd better not stop you working, James. Look after yourself. You too, dad. Bye. So that was that. He knew and was prepared to give her an alibi. I was sad to think that I'd probably never see or talk to him again. Wendy squeezed my hands. So, you disowned him. I suppose I can understand that if he knew what she was doing and kept it from you. I don't think it's right, but I can understand. I was starting to get very tense and Wendy could see it. I sat there, and she held me to her chest. I was certainly glad to have her with me. Looking down at those gorgeous eyes was some compensation for my world falling apart again. It took a few minutes for me to recover my composure. So you collected the evidence and got a divorce. They don't put you in prison for that, do they? No, Wendy, they don't and if that's all I'd done, I would have been okay. I'm afraid I went further than that. You probably won't like me much when you find out. I think I'll be the judge of that, Derek. Now why don't you tell me the rest of the story before we call him in to see what he wants? When Jessica came home on Sunday, I did my best to act normally. To be honest, it wasn't difficult. We hardly ever had sex because she was always too tired. During the week we hardly saw each other anyway. On Tuesday evening I checked the live stream from John Preston's office. Sure, enough as soon as most people had left, Jessica joined him. They started hugging and kissing and his hands were on her arse by the time I went to teach my class. During break I checked again, just in time to see Jessica bend over his desk and having sex. By the end of classes, they had gone and the office was dark. The following day, they left on time so there was nothing to check. However, my bedroom camera picked up significant action. It also raised questions. Why did Jessica never tell me what she liked in bed? God knows I would have done that for her. I would have been a lot more adventurous than John Preston. Hell, he didn't even use a blindfold. Thursday they were at it in the office again. No wonder I didn't getting any sex. Even if she'd been awake, she would have been worn out. I'm ashamed to say, I let it go on another two weeks to see if there was a pattern. I didn't just want a divorce. I wanted to hurt them the way they had hurt me. I was running on autopilot. The only thing that kept me going to work every day was my anger. People at work commented on how snappy I'd become. Students asked what had happened to my famous sense of humor. The lovers, of course, noticed nothing. By the end of the second week, I knew what I was going to do. I knew next Thursday evening would be an office sex session, so I put a plan into action. No one was surprised to see Dirty Harry working at the weekend, so no questions were asked when I turned up. I used a library computer and another redundant account to set up a website with the name of officesexcapade.com. 
It had video streaming facilities, and I set up links to various spicy sites to make it look authentic. Then I produced the posters for the notice boards around college. www.officesexcapade.com goes live 6 p.m. on Thursday, don't miss it. This week for limited time, only this site goes live. And yes, we do mean live. Be among the first to witness this amazing content. As the notices were taken down, I replaced them, making sure I was never caught by any camera or any person. I'd even managed to get them up on library and church notice boards around the town. Come Thursday, I was ready. At 5.30, I added the finishing touch to the website and dubbed over the top of the video display. It read, Tonight's content comes to live from Bronceston College. At 5.55 p.m., I checked the live stream. Preston had started unbuttoning Jessica's blouse. I went off to my lesson, which was conveniently a computer class. After the first five minutes, it was clear we would get no work done. First, the whispers started. Then as they got more excited, the level rose so that I could hear every word. It's coming from this college. Hey, I recognize him. He's the vice principal. He teaches one of my math classes. Who is the old slapper he's screwing? Dunno, but she's got a great body. I know her. She's his secretary. Look, she's giving him a BJ. I'm emailing my mates. They can't miss this. Up to that point, I had been somewhat ambivalent to the responses. On one hand, I was happy to expose the pair of them for the liars they were. On the other, he was screwing my wife, the woman I loved for more than 20 years. It was that love that made me forgive her so much in the past, but not this time. My lesson had already fallen apart, but then came the comment that pushed me over the top. Oh my God, he's going nuts on her. Prezer, you dirty man. Even when our sex life was good, Jessica had never allowed me to do anything I saw in the video. The red mist descended. My rage was released. Without really thinking about what I was doing, I left my class and hurried to the admin block. I couldn't believe they had been so complacent. They hadn't even locked the door. I charged into the office grabbing Preston by the hair. I wrenched him off my wife and slammed his forehead against the edge of the open door. He fell to the floor where I started kicking him, first in the balls and then as he rolled over. The kicks landed in the stomach and chest. I was in a rage. My anger was with both of them, but 20 years of love, and an upbringing that said it was wrong to hit women meant that Preston got it all. I was conscious of Jessica screaming at me to stop. It was only when she threw herself on top of him that I did indeed stop. I stepped back, shocked at what I had done. As I walked backwards I came to a chair and fell down onto it. Jessica looked up at me and realized that it was safe to get up. Still half naked, she ran into her outer office returned with her phone. I heard her talking. Ambulance, she said. There has been an accident and I think a man is badly injured. Better call the police, Jess. Half the world knows it wasn't an accident. You might also consider getting dressed. What do you mean half the world knows? How could they? Your antics tonight have been live streamed on the internet, and so has my attack on Preston here. In fact, it's still going out so get dressed and call the police. Oh, Derek, you haven't? One look at my face told her I had. She ran around the office picking up her clothes and putting them on. As soon as she had covered herself, she called the police. She paced back and forth in the office before turning back to me. How clear were the pictures, Derek? Could you see who we were? Well, my class recognized him immediately. They didn't know who you were, but I guess they do now. She put her hands to her face. Oh God, Derek, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to sit here and wait for the police. Perhaps you'd better go to the hospital with Loverboy here. It wasn't love, Derek, just sex. Exciting sex because we were doing things we shouldn't, but just sex all the same. It doesn't matter anymore, Jess. You wanted or needed someone else, so now you don't have to sneak around. I'm going to be out of circulation for some time. You'll be free to screw who you like. She sat with her head in her hands crying. The paramedics arrived first and started to treat Preston. Jessica had to decide whether to go to hospital with him or not when the police arrived and I was led away in handcuffs. It took the police a day to decide to charge me with grievous bodily harm. Within two days, I was in court being formally charged. I'd opted for the duty solicitor, and he tried to get me released on bail. I'd instructed him not to do so, but he felt he had to do his best for me. The magistrate asked if I could post bail. Your Honor, I have little money. My parents are both dead, and I'm not in contact with my wife, nor do I wish to be. I can't see any way I can raise enough money to post bail. He gave me a searching look. You realize, Mr. Callahan, Without someone to post bail, I will have to remand you in custody. Would you like more time so that you can speak to your wife? No, sir. Custody is fine. I was on remand for two months. 
I got frequent visits from my solicitor trying to convince me to plead not guilty due to temporary insanity. I had several requests from Jessica for a visiting order so she could come and see me. I refused. My solicitor told me, under British law a wife cannot be forced to give evidence against her husband and Jessica had refused. Of course, it had gone out over the internet, so there would be plenty of other witnesses. When you're in prison, it's surprising what you find funny. I got a letter from the College Human Resource Department informing me that I was the subject of a disciplinary hearing and asking who I wanted to represent my interests. I found it amusing that even in the face of overwhelming evidence, they still had to go through their procedures. I wrote back saying I was offering no defense. The next communication from them told me I'd been fired and all about the appeals procedure. Unable to get in to see me, Jessica also resorted to writing letters. My dearest Derek, I have no idea how to apologize for what I've done to you. Please believe, I didn't do it to hurt you. Nor did love have anything to do with it. I can't explain why I did what I did, but I have to tell you that you are, and always have been, my one and only love. I know you have been dismissed by the college. They are waiting for John to get out of hospital before they hold his disciplinary hearing. He has several broken ribs and had a collapsed lung. The doctors aren't sure whether he will be infertile. I've told him I'll tell the principal that he used his position to force me to have sex with him unless he withdraws all charges and refuses to give evidence. I will do it, my love. I'll do anything to get you out of that place so that I can start to make amends from what I have done to you. No matter how long it takes, I will wait for you, my love, and I hope that one day you may be able to forgive me. All my love, Jessica. I screwed it up and threw it away. A month later she wrote again, My dearest Derek, I am so sorry, not just for what I've done to you but also because I failed to persuade John to drop the charges. He didn't believe I would do what I said. He was wrong. I went with my union rep to see the principal. I told him John had pressured me into having sex with him and made sure you were always out of the way when we met. I don't know if he believed me but it didn't matter. The union started a sexual harassment action. Both John and I were dismissed. Sad to say that has made John more determined to ensure you go to prison. I'm so sorry, my love. I tried my best. Your solicitor says you refuse to consider the only defense that might work. Please reconsider my love. You don't deserve to be in that place. You did what you did because we drove you to it. I will always love you and will wait as long as it takes. All my love. Jessica. I have to admit, I was surprised they'd fired Preston. I'd expected the management to close ranks around him, but Jessica had given them no choice. My trial was almost a non-event. My barrister tried to persuade me to use the temporary insanity plea, but once again, I refused. I insisted I would plead guilty. I was happy for him to use extreme provocation and mitigation. My guilty plea meant the prosecution didn't have to offer any evidence other than the extent of John Preston's injuries. They did this using photographs and medical reports. He was peeved that he wasn't asked to tell the court his side of the story. Jessica and James were there. She was crying most of the time, and he was trying to comfort her. The judge listened to my barrister's pleas of mitigation before turning his attention to me. Mr. Callahan, your counsel has made a very good case that you were acting while the balance of your mind was disturbed. I take it the option to use that as a defense has been mentioned to you. Yes, sir, it has. Do you wish to change your plea? No, sir. I committed the crimes and want the world to know that I planned and executed justice on the man who was sleeping with my wife. I am willing to take my punishment. Very well. Derek Callahan, you have pleaded guilty to the charge that you assaulted Mr. John Preston, causing him grievous bodily harm. This is a very serious offense and one for which I could hand down a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. However, your counsel has made a good case for extreme provocation in that Mr. Preston was abusing his power to keep you out of the way so he could have sex with your wife. I find this to be the sort of provocation few men could resist. Even given this situation, I would still be bound to sentence you to 10 years in prison. However, at the point of your arrest you pleaded guilty to the charges, saving the taxpayer significant expense and saving your victim the trauma of reliving the attack. Under the guidelines given to me I can, therefore, have the sentence. Mr. Callahan, I sentence you to spend five years in prison. I looked at the public gallery. Preston was punching the air as if he had won some sort of victory. Jessica just gasped and buried her head in her hands as the warders took me down to the cells. My barrister came to my cell after the trial. Well, Mr. Callahan, I still think I could have got you off, but five years is a good result. If you keep your nose clean, you could be out in two and a half to three years. I suppose I should thank you for that, but to tell you the truth, I'm not sure I want to get out. What have I got to come out to? My family is destroyed. My career is in the toilet. 
I don't really care when I get out. Why didn't you tell me any of this before, Derek? It seems almost as if I don't know you at all. Would I have got this job if they'd known I had a criminal record? Of course not. Most people here wouldn't even talk to me if they knew. Would you have let me get close to you? Aren't you already wondering how you can dump me? If that is what you think, perhaps I should dump you, as you put it. I'm having a great deal of difficulty believing the man I know, the man I fell in love with, could do such a thing. From what you said the violence was a split-second reaction which, given the circumstances, I can understand. It's the cold-blooded planning of your wife's total humiliation that I can't believe. The man you fell in love with wouldn't have done that. I am the man you know, at least I am now. Maybe the judge and the barrister were right. Maybe the balance of my mind was disturbed. I couldn't believe she would rip my heart out again but Preston was the guy I wanted. He'd made me a laughing stock. They even called me Dirty Harry because I got all the shit jobs. Some of the others must have known it was so he could keep screwing my wife. In my head I was hitting back at him and the college. Let's see them deny a live broadcast, I thought. It even went out through college servers so they couldn't pretend it came from elsewhere. Jessica was just collateral damage. To my surprise she pulled my head back down to her chest and held it there as I cried reliving that fateful day. She lifted my head again and looked at me. Again Derek? You said you didn't think she could rip your heart out again. Had you caught Jessica cheating on you before? I didn't catch her, no. She thinks I don't know, but it wasn't the first time. She's done it at least once before, shortly after we were married. If you didn't catch her, how can you be so sure? I've seen the evidence. Believe me, I'm sure. Just a minute, Derek. If you've been in prison, how did you get this job? I mean you need clear criminal records check? I laughed. If people knew just how easy it is to get around those things, they wouldn't value them so highly. You would be amazed at how many Derek Callahans there are with clean records. I just had to become one of them. We both sat holding each other. I was relieved she hadn't left me. I'd lied my way into everything since I'd left prison, and I hadn't been able to tell Wendy the truth. Several times I'd come close, but each time, discretion got the better of my valor. I wanted to tell her, and if I'd been able to marry her, I would have. As it was, it didn't seem to be worth the risk of the information getting out. Wendy took her arm from around my shoulders and held both my hands in hers. Derek, you know we are going to have to speak to the young man outside. Now he has found you, the game is up. Unless, that is, we can persuade him to keep his mouth shut. Now I'm going to call him in. Then you are going to talk to him. Please, Derek, please talk to him. She got up and walked to the door. When she came back, James followed her in. James was a good-looking young man, standing six feet tall with broad shoulders and an athletic build. He had light brown hair which in the summer sun became almost blonde. He had a square jaw with a cleft chin and his blue eyes sparkled when he smiled. A look at Wendy's face told me she was impressed. She looked at me, looked at him, and then back at me. Your wife must be a good-looking woman, Derek. He certainly doesn't take after you. I mean, I think you're quite a hunk but James here must be every girl's dream. James smiled at her. I'll settle for being Emma's dream, thank you. Well James, you and Derek must have a lot to talk about. I'm going to make some coffee. Would you like some? James accepted the offer of coffee and Wendy went off to the kitchen leaving us alone. For about a minute we sat in silence. James was fidgeting while he watched me, unsure of how to start. I had no intention of making it any easier for him. I just relaxed on the sofa and waited. Eventually he spoke. Why did you do it, Dad? Come off it, James. You and half the world know why I did it. I'm not talking about that. Why did you disappear like that? You knew she was waiting for you. When you didn't reply to any of her letters, she tried to get the governor to keep her informed and tell her when you would be released. We thought you had another three months to go when the police came and told us you were out. The prison gave mum the address of the hostel you went to. I went there but you were long gone. Why go to a hostel when you could have come home? Why risk going back to prison by just disappearing from the hostel? I don't know what she's told you about what I did and why, but even from what was reported you must realize there was no way I could go back. What not even for a few weeks, Dad? Do you really hate Mum so much that you would rather go to a bail hostel than go home to your own bed, even if it was only while you got back on your feet? She and her lover spent two years manipulating me. I wasn't going to give her another chance. You should have read her letters. She wanted to try to make it up to you. She knows how much she hurt you. She wanted to try to put things right. I've had enough of this, James. You didn't search for me just to ask why I didn't go home. What is it you want from me? What happens if you don't get it? Are you going to tell the police where I am, so they can put me back in prison? I want you to come back and talk to her. She's ill? Dad, very ill. She was okay when she thought you would come back, but when you disappeared, 
She hit the bottle. Now she has cirrhosis of the liver and needs a transplant. They won't do that while she is still drinking. I hate what she did to you, Dad, but she's the only mom I've got. I can't see her killing herself like this. I need you to tell her you forgive her. Tell her to stop the drinking. Or what, James? What happens if I don't go with you? Do I need to move on before the police come after me for breaking my parole conditions? She might be your only mom, but for me she is already dead. Or nothing, Dad. I don't want to see you back in that place, and I don't think the police are interested. When I asked them to help me find you, they just said they would find you when you committed another crime. Wendy came in with the coffee. Sounds like James is talking since here, Derek. You need closure, and if that helps your wife, then so much the better. I know you don't really wish her any harm. How do you know? Because you beat him to a pulp, but never laid a finger on her. I sat for a minute. I'd never thought about it before, but she was right. Listen, James, the only reason I did not beat her up was the fact that she is a woman. It was not my love for her, but for my mother, who taught me never to hit a woman. So, I wouldn't have dreamed of hurting Jessica in spite of her betrayal. What harm can it do to talk to her, Derek? So now it was two against one and I was losing. Okay, I'll go and talk to her, but don't expect anything to change. She'll have to accept the fact that I'm not coming back. I'll talk to her on one condition. I said turning to James. You stop calling me dad. He just sat shaking his head. One mistake two and a half years ago and he disowns me. What the hell can I do? Give him time, James. I'm sure he'll come round. You don't know him. I let him down. I know I did, and now he'll never forgive me or mom. We left the next morning, all three of us. James didn't want Wendy to come because he didn't want Jessica to know I had found someone else. I insisted that she should come with us. I wanted everything out in the open. He tried to make conversation on the journey, but it was an uphill struggle for James. I didn't intentionally ignore him. My mind was too occupied for any talking. All the time I was reliving those days running up to the main event and my assault on Preston. It felt strange pulling into the drive of my old house. If I didn't know better, I would have sworn it was empty. The grass needed cutting. The curtains hung loosely at the windows which were in dire need of cleaning. James had his own key and let us in through the front door. I had never seen my house in such a mess. He led us into the living room and asked us to sit down. He went upstairs to fetch his mother. He took quite some time to come down with her. When Jessica came in, I barely recognized her. Her face was gaunt and her skin had a yellowish tinge to it. She had lost a lot of weight and the dress she wore just hung on her. When she saw me, she tried to smile and held her arms out to me. Derek, you've come home? No. I've just come to talk to you. I'm not coming home, never. Wendy squeezed my hand and looked lovingly at me which made Jessica look uncomfortable. James helped her to a seat. I'd like to say you are looking well, Jess, but you must know that's not true. Same old Derek, can't lie to save your life. They told me that's why you ended up in prison. Water under the bridge, Jess. All finished with. Now James says you want to talk to me so why not just say what you have to say. Now you're finally here, I don't know where to start. Did you read any of my letters? Only the two you sent while I was on remand. The rest I didn't even open. Do you hate me that much, Derek? You didn't have to reply, but if I could just believe you read them, I'd have felt so much better. Hate had nothing to do with it, Jess. Quite the reverse. I loved you so much the only way I could deal with what we did to each other was to cut that part right out of my life. I never wanted to think of it again. You want to know why I didn't read any of your letters? It's because in prison a man who sits in his cell and weeps might as well be a dead man. So that's it, is it, Derek? You've cut me out of your life with no chance of forgiveness? I don't know, Jess. I don't have feelings for you. So perhaps you can say that I have forgiven you already. I hate what you did just as I hate what I did. One can say that what I did to you was cruel and heartless, but I just gave you back what you gave me. I do feel that I should have just divorced you. Come to think of it, I should have divorced you the first time. Jessica's mouth fell open. She pulled her hands up to her face and cried. As she regained her control, she looked at me through red eyes. You've known for all those years and said nothing? Why? It was over when I found out, and it gave you the child I seemed to be unable to provide. I pulled a worn and tatty envelope from my pocket and passed it to James. That's why you shouldn't call me dad. I'm not your father. James looked at the letter as he took it from the envelope. I don't understand. What is this? It's the results of a DNA paternity test. You were the subject and as you can see, you and I, are not related. The only sound in the room was Jessica sobbing. Wendy was looking from James to Jessica, not knowing who to comfort first. In the end she settled on Jessica. James was in shock. I don't understand. If you're not my father, then who is? 
I think it was a bloke called Donald Wilson. He and your mother were very friendly for a while, too friendly for my liking. She assured me there was nothing to it. They seemed to fall out around the time your mom became pregnant. Six months after you were born, he died in a car crash. So, how long have you known? According to the date, I was two when this test was done. I suspected the truth within a couple of months of your birth. Neither of us had blue eyes and we both have dark hair. When your eyes didn't turn brown or even green, I realized you probably weren't mine. It kept eating away at me. I had to know. When paternity tests became affordable, I had you tested. For all those years you knew, and you didn't do or say anything. Why? I wanted to leave but the night I was going to finally leave, you held my finger and spoke out your first words. It was then that I realized that me leaving would have taken away a whole life from you. So, I swallowed my pride and my anger, just so that you can have a life. I had already moved away from your mother emotionally. So just like that you decided to bring up another man's child and say nothing to anyone about it for 25 years. Didn't you think that I had a right to know? Let me ask you something, James. In the first 20 of those years, did you ever feel unwanted or unloved? Right up to the point when you decided to collude with your mother in deceiving me, did you ever feel less than my own son? You know I didn't. For what it's worth, I didn't know mom was cheating on you. Mom told me she was arranging some sort of surprise for you and not to tell you about her visit. Whatever, it's all done now. The way I see it, James, your mother's still your mother. Your father's dead and you've had the benefit of a stepfather for 25 years. Unless you are saying that I shouldn't have given you that, get off your high horse and accept it. Wendy interrupted us in an attempt to calm things down. Derek, I think we could all do with a cup of tea. Why don't we go and make one while James and Jessica get over the bomb you just dropped? I took Wendy out to the kitchen. We were confronted with a scene I never thought I'd see. The sink was full of dishes. The worktops were dirty and liberally sprinkled with empty bottles. Wendy and I looked around us before looking at each other. Sorry, Wendy. Looks like a cleanup is top priority. She stood in front of me, threw her arms around me and hugged me tightly. I said yesterday, you weren't the man I knew. I take that back. Any man who's been through what you have for all those years was bound to go a little crazy. You really should have gone for temporary insanity. She pulled my head down and kissed me. Right Derek, let's get stuck in. We cleared the work surfaces of bottles and washed them down before making a start on the dishes. An hour later we returned with the tea. James and his mother sat together on the sofa with their arms around each other. Wendy served the tea to Jessica who looked her up and down. Derek has been very remiss in not introducing you. Are you his girlfriend? Look after him. He needs a good woman. I will if he'll let me. My nervousness had made me forget the protocols. I introduced Wendy as my friend. I think she is more than that, Derek. You look at her the way you used to look at me. Before I threw it all away. You're right, Jess. She is more than a friend. She is the best thing to happen to me in more than five years. But we aren't here to discuss me and Wendy, are we? You wanted to talk to me, so what did you want to say? We sat silently drinking our tea. Jessica trying to get her head sorted ready to say what she needed to get off her chest. She took a deep breath looked me in the eye and spoke. Derek, James has made me realize that there is no chance of you coming back home. It's not my home anymore, Jessica. Please don't interrupt, Derek. This is hard enough. I'd like to try to explain, as much as I understand it myself. She paused and then started again. It's not enough, but I am sorry for what I did to you. I've tried to understand why I did it, because I really do love you. I suppose that must be difficult to believe. You see, I've always been able to compartmentalize my life, almost as if I had more than one life. In the compartment with John Preston, you only existed as a sort of abstract concept, a sort of notional husband. In your compartment, he was just a faceless person who was your boss. When I was with him, I'm sorry to say I never thought of you. When you and I were together, I never thought about him. Of course, there was a sort of in-between time when I balanced the two, and that was the only time I felt guilty about what I did to you. I felt guilty, Derek. Really I did, but it was such a turn on. The man had power over you and me. They say power is an aphrodisiac, and it is. He had the power to make me available for him by ensuring you were always out of the way. The fact that he wanted me was enough. I said he used his position to force me into it, but he didn't have to force me. I just said that to try to get him to drop the assault charges. So, there was no love there then? None at all, Derek. It was just sex and the excitement of doing things I shouldn't with a man with power. So why did you lay on top of him to protect him from me? That was to protect you from yourself. I've never seen you like that. I thought you were going to kill him. I didn't know you were streaming it out to the internet. 
I thought if he wasn't too badly injured, we could say he had an accident. You took a hell of a risk. I might have hurt you too. No, you couldn't do that, Derek, not you. No matter what state you were in, you wouldn't hurt me. Preston would never have said it was an accident. If I was the only witness, he wouldn't have had much choice. But you had to send it out on the internet. Why did you do that? Did you hate me that much? I realized most of the college management must have known what was happening. I wanted to make sure Preston and the rest of them couldn't wriggle out of it. So, I made sure there were plenty of witnesses. They couldn't deny it happened once the video went out on the internet. I wasn't aiming to hurt you but at the time, I didn't really care if I did. I didn't intend to attack him. I just sort of lost it. Well, if you wanted to hurt the college management, you certainly succeeded. Even the head of IT services got fired. The college was taken over by Amblesham College. You should have read my letters, Derek. You destroyed them all. I couldn't get a job either. I had to go tempying just to make ends meet. All of a sudden, James joined the conversation. Perhaps dad wouldn't have lost it if it was the first time you'd betrayed him, but you'd already done it before when you screwed my biological father. Jessica snapped back at him with a force she didn't look capable of. Don't you ever call that man your father. He was just a little shit who was happy to get his end away, but ran a mile when he found I was pregnant. Things got very tense in our marriage at the time due to our failure to have children. When I met Donald, I was easy prey for anyone who could offer a friendly shoulder. He offered me sympathy and made me think Derek didn't really want children. He gradually worked his way into my knickers. I thought I loved Donald and I thought he loved me, but I was wrong on both counts. When I became pregnant, I thought he'd be pleased and leave the wife he said he didn't love. Instead, he wanted me to pass you off as Derek's child and carry on as before. I realized he didn't love me. I was just a bit on the side for him. I told him I never wanted to see him again, and I never did. I'm glad he died because then he'd never try to claim you as his. When I told your father, Derek, your real father, was overjoyed and couldn't wait to be a daddy. I had no idea that he knew. James was left in limbo, and I have to say I felt sorry for him. However, I still found it difficult to forgive him, not for being someone else's son, but for colluding with his mother to deceive me. Emotions were running high, and it was getting too much for me. I had to bring it to an end. So Jess, you wanted to see me, and now you have. Where do we go from here? You must realize there is no way back for us. I suppose you're right, Derek. I had hoped I could make it up to you, but I can see that's a tall order. I wonder, could we possibly be friends? I don't have many drunks as friends. I'll get cleaned up, Derek. I will. I've got a place on a residential program to get dried out. If I stay off the booze for six months, they'll consider me for a liver transplant. Do you think you'll manage it? I'll try, Derek especially if we can be friends. I know you don't feel you can come and see me, but can I write to you? Will you read my letters? I can't promise anything. We wound things up and I got back in the car for the long drive home. At first it was a quiet ride. Wendy repeatedly squeezed my leg or pressed her face to my arm. When we pulled into a motorway service center, we started to chat. It was small talk at first while we decided whether or not to eat there. When we decided we would and sat down, Wendy decided to get to the point. Do I know everything now, Derek? Or is there any more to come out? Only what happened in prison. I haven't told anyone about that, and I probably never will. She reached out and squeezed my hand. Was it really that awful? I did things in there I was pleased about, but I also had to do things I wouldn't normally have dreamed of. However, my life was a lot better than many. Do you think you will ever be friends with Jessica? I don't know. I'll try. That's as much as I can say right now. What about James? You dropped quite a bombshell on him today. The ball is in his court now that he knows the truth. It's up to him to decide what he wants to do. Wendy reached across and took both of my hands in hers. You know you made me very proud of you today, don't you? Well, I do now. I smiled at her. Do I get a reward? I'd say there is a very good chance, she said with a grin. We finished our meal and walked back to the car with our arms around each other. I was indeed rewarded that night and for many the following nights. Jessica's first letter arrived after her first week in the rehab center. She found it difficult to live without alcohol, but expressed a determination to see it through. She couldn't resist some words of apology, but made no further attempt to persuade me to go back to her. I was impressed and wrote back offering encouragement. For three months we exchanged letters, each one more cordial than the previous one. I began to believe we could be friends. She got out of rehab, gained a bit of weight, and found herself a job. She still had health issues and was still on the list for a transplant. I was hopeful for her recovery. It came as a surprise when the correspondence came to an end. 
Things had seemed to be going well, and then she didn't reply to my letters. I was surprised at how it affected me. I felt she had let me down again. Wendy tried to keep my spirits up. She told me there was probably a good reason for it, and she would be back in touch sooner or later. The first snow of winter came on the first day of December. By the following weekend, we had two inches of white stuff covering the landscape. The estate staff had cleared the paths, but the grass and all the surrounding landscape changed to the sort of view you see on Christmas cards. I had finished my Saturday morning classes. Walking out into the quad, I was taken completely by surprise. James was leaning against the wall of the arch and greeted me as I came out of the lab. Well, Dad, even in the winter it still looks beautiful. One hell of a place to hide out. James, you know the whole story now, so you know we are not related. Look, I know what you said, but Mum was right. It doesn't matter whose sperm did the job. You are the only father I have ever known, and I think you did a damn good job. So no matter what you say, I will always think of you as my dad and I'm sorry I let you down. I put my arm around his shoulders, for what it's worth, you're still the best son I ever had. We started to walk down the path towards the cloisters. Jessica hasn't written for a while. How is she? James stopped and put his hand on my forearm. She's dead. She died last Friday of multiple organ failure. They thought it was a urinary tract infection, but then her kidneys packed up. While they were trying to stimulate them, her heart stopped. After the first heart attack, she signed a do-not-resuscitate agreement. She couldn't face a lifetime on dialysis, and they wouldn't do her liver unless they could find a kidney as well. I stopped and looked at him. I saw the tears coming to his eyes as I felt them welling up in mine. There were no barriers between us now. We threw our arms around each other and openly wept. We stood for several minutes, locked in an embrace with our bodies shaking as we sobbed. I fought back the tears as I pulled away from him and dried my eyes with a tissue. Why didn't she tell me? She didn't have to die alone. She wasn't alone, Dad. I was with her. So why didn't you call me? She knew I'd forgiven her. I would have come if you'd called me. That's why she wouldn't let me tell you. The reason the letters stopped is because someone let the papers know she was writing to you. She got a visit from a reporter. With the anniversary of the event coming up, he wanted to find you. Mum was determined that she wouldn't be the cause of any more misery for you. She knew you couldn't be a teacher with a criminal record, so either the school hadn't checked or you had obtained one by fraud. If that got out, you'd be finished again. She wouldn't let it happen and told me I was not to contact you. After all this time, they are still stirring it up? Are you sure? Oh yes, I'm sure. The slimy worm sought me out as well. Tried to tell me he wanted to tell your side of the story. Mum told me it would only be bad for you. I know it's hard to believe after what she did, but she really did love you. You're right. It is hard, but I am grateful for yours and her consideration. I did love her. After all those years, I can't just turn that off. When's the funeral? Tuesday, but don't even think of turning up. You can't take the risk. If you're not there, our friendly reporter may just give up. I put my arm around his shoulders as we turned and walked back towards my flat. Come on, son. Let's see if Winnie can rustle up some lunch for you. I think we're way ahead of you there, Dad. Emma and I got here about 10. She and Winnie have been working on lunch for a while. They went shopping about 10.30. We reached my front door and I let us into an empty flat. I got a beer for James and myself. We sat on the sofa drinking while waiting for the girls to get back. So, Dad, what happens to us now? Mum was the only link between us, yet she's gone. What happens now? Am I ever going to see you again? Don't get me wrong, James. Wendy didn't imagine Jessica was going to die, but she asked me a similar question on the way back from our visit. We may not share the same DNA, but I always thought of you as my son and loved you like my own. As I said before, all those years of love can't be turned off, but it had to be your decision. So, the question is, James, what do you want to happen? He sat and sipped his beer. I don't want anything to happen. I want mom's death to change nothing. Like she said, you are my real father. I will always think of you as my dad, and I want you to always think of me as your son. If that's what you want, then that's the way it'll be, I said as put my arm around him. We both struggled to keep the tears from our eyes as we held each other. We were still locked in an embrace when the door opened and Wendy came in. Well, it looks like you boys have come to your senses. James and I parted. I got up to help with the shopping. Emma followed Wendy into the flat. She saw me, let out a scream and ran towards me. Oh, Derek, it's so good to see you. It's been a long time, far too long. She stepped back and looked at me. You are looking very well. This place must agree with you. I looked her up and down. My son certainly had good taste. She had shoulder length, honey blonde hair, blue eyes, plump lips and high cheekbones. 
Her normally trim figure now had a prominent bulge in the front. I see you've noticed Derek Jr. Isn't it great? I smiled at her. Derek Jr.? Are you serious? If you don't mind. James wanted it and I agree. We love you, Derek. James was heartbroken about what happened to you. He loved Jessica too. So what happened tore him apart. As soon as we found out we were having a boy, James wanted to name him after you. Please say it's alright with you. What could I say? It was fine by me. The three of us sat down to chat while Wendy prepared the lunch. The atmosphere at the table was strained, a sweet and sour affair. The tears of joy at the reunion of our family mixed with the tears of sadness at Jessica's passing. I found it hard not to be able to attend her funeral, but her reasons were sound. For the first time since that fateful night, I came to realize I had forgiven her. I still couldn't understand why she did it, but I had to accept. In some strange way she did love me. Perhaps if I didn't turn up to the funeral, the press would leave me alone. Wendy certainly thought so because she started making arrangements for Christmas. James, I'm sorry, but I really hoped Derek would spend Christmas with me and my daughters. What I would like is to come to you for New Year. It would be like a new beginning for us all. Emma was overjoyed. Wendy, I think that's a great idea. We can have my parents for Christmas and then you and Derek for New Year. James moved on to practical subjects. The house is all yours now. You need to give some thought to what you are going to do with it. Then, of course, there's the money. Money? What money? I thought she was broke. The union launched an action against the college for sexual harassment. They settled out of court for 40,000 pounds. She wouldn't touch the money because she knew it was a lie. But once she started the action, she couldn't back down. She had intended to give you the money when you got out of prison to help you get back on your feet. I can't deal with that now, James. I'll have to think about it. We did spend Christmas with Wendy's daughters, and I was made very welcome. Both were pleased their mother had found someone. We got to Ditchling late New Year's Eve morning. I talked to James about the house and the money. We agreed he would handle the letting of the house. I had rented a flat on a short-term contract. Just long enough to get a utility bill so I could set up a bank account. As soon as the account was set up, I gave up the flat and did everything through the internet. James said he would get the solicitor to transfer the funds to my new account. You know, James, just like your mother, I don't want the money. It's tainted. Well, someone has to have it, Dad, unless you want the bankers to have it. Wendy and I have been talking. We want you to set up a trust fund for the education of Derek Jr. and any other children you might have. When you've done that, I'll transfer all the cash into it. Something good has to come out of that mess. If that's what you want, Dad, I'll do it. Pay the income from the house into the new account, and I can take it out in cash. Well, if you're careful, that should keep your whereabouts secure. That night we all went out to a New Year party. Around midnight we had the obligatory countdown and the toast to the new year. When the cheering died down, I looked at my little party and filled their glasses before proposing another toast. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you new beginnings. We all raised our glasses in the toast. As we put them down, I walked around and knelt on one knee in front of Wendy. Wendy Turnbull, would you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Wendy threw her arms around my neck. Oh, yes, Derek. Yes, yes, yes. I put the engagement ring on her finger. It was a perfect fit, and so were we. As she sat looking at the chip of diamond, I stood up. I had the best feeling I'd had in more than seven years. It truly was a new beginning. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.